Hello everyone, today we're starting yet another new series, so let's jump right in. Like our recently begun genetics series, we're starting a new series on concepts in zoology. A sensical place to start this series is taxonomy, the study of classification. Humans have always classified organisms all the way back to Aristotle. After all, it's not hard to classify organisms. Disparate, even distantly related organisms have various morphological characters in common, which lend themselves to being placed in a nested hierarchy. We now know why. Organisms form increasingly inclusive categories based on their evolutionary history. Of course, our classification systems are much more refined today, and we'll get into why later. Early systems group things as either animal, mineral, or vegetable, but that was when people didn't recognize the distinction between fungi and plants, and it was long before anyone knew about microbes or the true suite of biodiversity on Earth. Antony van Leeuwenhoek pioneered the field of microscopy in the late 1600s, realizing an entire microcosm existed right under, as well as in, our noses. He made his famous discoveries by using single-lens microscopes of his own design. The compound microscopes that were common in his day had problems with distortions and aberrations, which could only provide a clear image up to 40x magnification. But Leeuwenhoek's lenses were tiny and almost perfectly spherical, some of which could magnify up to 275x. With that, he could clearly observe the details of minuscule creatures that no one had ever seen before. He called these microbes animalcules, discovering both relatively big single-celled creatures, which we would later call protists, and even the very tiny ones which we now call bacteria. He also detailed the structures of various human cells. Because of his importance in the history of science, Van Leeuwenhoek has received wide recognition for his achievements. A hospital in Amsterdam that specializes in oncology was named after him. And in a review article, biochemist Nicolain wrote, quote, He was the first even to think of looking, certainly the first with the power to see. Using his own deceptively simple single-lens microscopes, he did not merely observe, but conducted ingenious experiments, exploring and manipulating his microscopic universe with a curiosity that belied his lack of a map or bearings. Leeuwenhoek was a pioneer, a scientist of the highest caliber." Close quote. Of course, Van Leeuwenhoek too was still unaware of how many different species of these animalcules there actually were, but his discoveries opened up a whole new world to be explored. In 1758, Swedish botanist Carolus Linnaeus published a book titled Systema Naturae, in which he laid out his taxonomic system for classifying organisms. Going from most to least inclusive, his system set forth these groupings. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. The genus species name we identify organisms by is known as their binomial nomenclature. For example, humans are Homo sapiens, dogs are Canis lupus, and cats are Felis domesticus. In Linnaeus' day, speciation, or the transmutation of species, wasn't a concept of consideration. Every organism was created in its specific species where only slight variations were allowed. By the time Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species in 1859, Linnaeus's taxonomic system was already groaning under the constantly growing number of known organisms. Discoveries like Archaeopteryx in 1861 made the system strain even more because fossils like this seemed halfway between two different totally distinct groups, the birds and reptiles. And as the bone wars raged from the late 1870s to the early 1890s, the system had to incorporate various new, but extinct organisms unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. How were Triceratops, Allosaurus, and Diplodocus related to modern reptiles? However, because taxonomy was invented before evolution, its system was somewhat problematic. Because in the binomial designation system there could never be an almost this species or a nearly new one, it could never describe the ancestor-descendant relationships that evolution necessitates. Dendrograms were thus employed to help show relationships between different groups of organisms. Along with this, researchers had to invent many new ranks for classifying organisms, such as infraorders, superclasses, subphyla, domains, tribes, and others. 
Even all these additional ranks weren't enough, as many described taxa remained unranked. With the benefit of greater understanding, we now know that the old Linnaean and additional taxonomic ranks are quite arbitrary. And they don't make sense when we consider the numerous extinct and often transitional forms. As we have noted in the previous video, do dogs produce non-dogs? Where we compared two species of non-avian dinosaurs with two species of primitive birds. According to the rank-based system of Linnaean taxonomy, two of these belong to an entirely different taxonomic class as the other two. This is what you get when one taxon is paraphyletic to another. One will inevitably contain members that are extremely similar to, or almost indistinguishable from, some members of the other taxon. Such organisms that walk on these gray transitional lines are most often extinct, giving us the modern impression of great divisions between high-ranked taxa, such as the classes of birds and reptiles. However, these distinctions are merely artifacts of long evolutionary divergences and the extinction of intermediates. Therefore, a better system of classification was needed that could adequately describe the whole diversity of life, extant or extinct, whether they are ancestral, transitional, or modern. One system that takes the principles of evolution into account. This new systematic classification of life eventually became known as cladistics. The term clade was coined in 1957 by biologist Julian Huxley to describe a monophyletic group of organisms, meaning a common ancestor and all its descendants. This laid the foundation for the new science of cladistics where relationships among organisms are based on synapomorphies or shared derived characteristics. It largely ditched the Linnaean ranks, only referencing as a matter of tradition, but not of great importance. Under this system, fossils don't need to be considered direct ancestors of anything alive today, but they can be identified as cousins with the cladistic measuring stick of shared features suggesting how close a cousin they are. The later advent of molecular methods thus allowed for the birth of phylogenetics. And, on that note, we're going to turn things over to someone who excels at talking about phylogenetics. Give it up for the creator and founder of the Phylogeny Explorer Project, Aaron Ra. Hi, I'm Aaron Ra, director of the Phylogeny Explorer Project. I'm going to try to explain cladistic phylogenetics. If you compare any two organisms, it's easy to see the differences between them, especially if we pick the two most distinct things we can think of, like a pine tree and an elephant, for example. They're both part of the same domain, eukarya, but they're about as different from each other as any two eukaryotes can be. If you only look at two species at a time, you'll always be able to tell the difference between them, like even between two elephants and two pine trees. But if you compare three or more species at once, then you'll notice that one of these things is not like the others, and two of these things are kind of the same. That's what Carolus Linnaeus noticed when he tried to systematically classify all living things. It wasn't just that some animals had legs or laid eggs or some didn't. It wasn't like you could just sort every organism into one or two umbrella kinds of life. It turned out to be way more complicated than that. And not just because of the number of horizontal categories, but the stack of vertical categories. Wherein, everything in two daughter sets within one parent group also belonged to a hierarchy of other boxes within boxes, like folders within folders. And some of the other things in boxes horizontally and to the side also belonged to the same few, top few boxes vertically. What Linnaeus discovered was a branching tree pattern that the notion of created kinds could not account for or explain away. Now, evolution does explain this, but Linnaeus didn't know about that because he lived a hundred years before Darwin. To illustrate this another way, let's look back at the elephant and the pine tree and, and let's compare them to some other things, like a starfish, for example. Now, these things are all very different things still, aren't they? I mean, except for the elephant and the starfish both belong to the animal kingdom because they're both multicellular eukaryotes with an internal digestive system, while the pine tree belongs to kingdom plantae because it has cell walls and chloroplast. People tend to be more interested in animals than plants because, you know, we are animals. You are a multicellular eukaryote with an internal digestive system. That's what an animal is. So we'll stick with animals for the rest of this illustration and add a fish. And not a starfish, because, you know, just because you call it a starfish doesn't mean that it's a fish. To be a fish, it at least has to be a chordate. Even though all of these animals are very different, the fish and the elephant both belong to the phylum chordata, because they both have a spinal cord. And although you'll never see it, I'll bet you have a spinal cord too. And that means that you and the elephant are both fish. Well, except that fish doesn't really mean anything anymore, because cladistic taxonomy has changed all the rules. A clade is a taxonomic grouping that includes every descendant of that group without exclusions like all of these except for that. 
uh, that would be paraphyletic. Cladistic classification is monophyletic, meaning every descendant, all of them, no exceptions. So either every chordate is a fish or none of them are. So the word fish could effectively mean chordate if it means anything in taxonomy. Now, some say it should be vertebrate instead of chordate, but you know, whatever. Now let's throw in a lizard, any random lizard. You know, there are like 6,000 species of lizards that are still alive today. That's not including those in the fossil record, and it's not counting snakes either, because snakes are lizards now too. That's part of the new way. Because if snakes used to be lizards, then they're still lizards now. But you know what are not lizards? Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are terrible lizards because they were never lizards at all. And pterosaurs, which some people call dinosaur birds, are not dinosaurs. But birds are dinosaurs. And birds are the last surviving subset of dinosaurs because they evolved from dinosaurs, which means that they're technically reptiles just like lizards. Though they're not lizards, they're from a different group. Because the law of monophyly is that you can't grow out of your ancestry. A new species gets a new name, but not any of the higher taxonomic levels, which remain undefined. We just keep those names to use as signposts to keep from getting lost as we navigate the tree of life. And I know it's confusing, mixing colloquial and scientific terms, but if anything alive today was once a reptile, then it's still a reptile. But we were never reptiles, because that word doesn't mean what it used to either. Reptiles now referred only to sauropsids, not synapsids like us. So chickens are reptiles, but Dimetrodon is not, because it's more closely related to us than it is to any dinosaur. So looking at all of these, we can see that two of these things are kind of the same, because they're vertebrates with backbones and they're tetrapods having four legs, as well as amniotes being born in amniotic fluid. But vertebrata, tetrapoda, and amniota didn't make it into Linnaeus's list of taxonomic ranks because that was too advanced for the 1700s. We've had to build the system up a bit since then. So we'll swap out the lizard for a mouse because elephants are supposed to be afraid of mice, or so they say, and there's a huge size difference. So these two got to be very different, right? Except that they both belong to the mammalian class because they're warm-blooded, hairy, and they have memory glands. And there's at least a 50-50 chance that you have memory glands too, which means that people are mammals just like elephants. Except that people and elephants are in different taxonomic orders. So this is where our lineage and that of elephants diverge, at least according to Linnaeus's way too simplistic system. We are in the order of primates, whereas elephants are in the proboscidean order. Now, elephants might be the only things you can think of from that order because the rest went extinct a really long time ago. Things like Moriotherium, Gomphotherium, Dinotherium, Platybelodon, Tetrabelodon, Stegotetrabelodon, and Mastodon. They're obviously related to elephants, but they're not elephants. They're all in the same order, but not in the same family. Elephants are, of course, in the elephant family, Elephantidae, where everything in that family is an elephant, just like we are in the ape family, Hominoidea, where everything in our family is an ape including you. There are several species of apes, including humans, and just like there are several species of elephant. Most of them are dead now too, like the woolly mammoth, Columbian mammoth, and the enormous Paleoloxodon, possibly the largest land mammal that has ever lived, much bigger than the three regular sized elephants that we have left today, two African and one Asian. Now, Linnaeus classified everything by physical characteristics, so our taxonomic hierarchy was originally based only on morphology wherein Linnaeus lamented that he was unable to tell humans apart from apes, and he classified us along with chimpanzees and orangutans as if we were essentially the same thing, because we are. Because now they've unlocked the genome, which proved that Linnaeus was right. We don't just look like apes, we are apes, genetically. And that fact meant that the deliberately, deceptively contrived taxonomy from the 1700s had to be revised and corrected. We now understand that an ape is any member of the taxonomic superfamily Hominoidea, and that includes humans. Although, some people object to that, imagining that evolution is supposed to teach that one kind of animal suddenly turned into another fundamentally different kind. But it's not like that at all, and it never was. In fact, that would violate the evolutionary laws of monophyly and biodiversity. But it's easier to understand now that we can see that every taxonomic kind of thing your evolutionary ancestors ever were, you still are, even if you're also the start of something new. Comparing genetic orthologs, matching gene sequences, allows us to perform paternity tests, not just to see who your father was, but much further back, to also see who or perhaps what your great, 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 so on, and 
on grandfather was and precisely how we and they are related to everyone else in humanity or everything else in the biosphere. The reason it's called phylogenetics is because of the inclusion or fusion of DNA into taxonomy. It's now a twin nested hierarchy where genomic sequence comparisons overlay the original tree that was based on morphology alone and provides additional evidence to confirm or sometimes correct what we could previously only determine from fossils. And this new means of objective verification was a vast improvement, uh, requiring revision of the antiquated 18th century system to update it. It's no longer just seven taxonomic ranks. There are at least 10 times that many named clades just in your ancestry from the earliest or most primitive organisms all the way to you. And we're learning more all the time so that a few years from now, we'll we will have discovered a few more. Thanks, Oren. Clearly, Taxonomy has come a long way from its roots in the 18th century. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.